Belle Gunness lived on a farm in Laporte, Indiana. She had a husband who died. She also had a child who died and many suitors who also died. After a raging fire at her house, body parts were found in a pig pen and also the bodies of her children and herself were found in the basement. However, no head was found on her body and was it really her? Welcome to Enter the Dark. Hello and welcome to Enter the Dark, your journey into the macabre parts of the world that we talk about and show you. I'm Jan from Film Daddy, with me as always is Les from Tales from the Hangman. How's it going Les, you okay there? All good here, all good here on my lockdown pad, it's all so, fun. We'd just like to say another big thank you to everyone who's new subscribers and have been watching the videos. At the moment we are on 236 subscribers at this very minute and you guys just seem to love the Sylvia Likens video um it's got over 7,000 views now so thank you so much if you'd listened to our last video which was on the Moors murders you would have heard us say even now this still stirs up emotions in Britain and we weren't fucking wrong we weren't were we we weren't we've, wrong at all we've had elderly women on our Facebook telling us we should take her down our site, calling us vultures. Honestly, we we're going to do a whole video on it just because it's so funny. But I've waffled on for far too long now. Let's get into this. Today's episode is on Belle Gunness. She is known as the female bluebeard. The female bluebeard? Yeah. Does she have a hormone problem or something? Well, possibly. You know, she was quite an angry woman. She killed quite I mean, a lot. I don't judge. I don't judge like, I mean, but... That's a lot. You judge more than anyone. It's it's true. Enough of this. Let's get on with it. Belle Gunnis was born on November 11th, 1859, near the lake of Selbu. Apologies if you are Norwegian. I'm going to butcher your language worse than I did the French. She was born near the lake of Selbu, Sautrodelag, Norway, and was christened Grinhald Polsdatter Staustet. Nailed it. Her parents were Paul Pedersen Staustet, a stonemason, and Berit Olsdatter. She was the youngest of their eight children. They lived in Stors de Giet. Yeah, I'm going with that. Stors de Giet. A very small cottage farm in Imbigde, 37 miles southeast of Trondheim. Nailed it. The largest city in central Norway. Now we've got this unverified story, right, about a childhood. It was shown on an Irish TV documentary in 2006. It's unverified. Might have happened, might not. But the story goes that in 1877, she attended a country dance while pregnant. And then she was attacked by a man who kicked her in the abdomen, causing her to miscarry the child. The man who came from a rich family was never prosecuted by the Norwegian authorities. So according to people who knew her, her personality after that changed markedly. The man who attacked her died shortly afterwards. His cause of death was said to be stomach cancer. Keep that in your head. He died. Stomach Keep that in your head. Having grown up in poverty, Gunnis took service the next year on a large, wealthy farm and served there for three years in order to pay for a trip across to the Atlantic. Following the example of her sister, Nellie Larson, who had emigrated to America earlier, Gunnis moved to the United States in 1881 and assumed a more American-style name. Initially, she worked as a servant. So, she changed the name now. You know, Belle Gunnis. It's better than that one that I butchered. I say better. I'm not saying Norwegian names aren't as good as American names. Maybe, maybe not. I'll, I'll weigh them up. Anyway, in 1884, Gunnis married Mads Ditlev Anton Sorensen in Chicago, Illinois, where two years later, they opened a confectionery store. You know, sweets, yes. cakes, you know, fizzy pop, soda fountain, I imagine. The business was yep. not successful because they weren't selling. <laughs> they weren't selling it. They, you know, we've opened a confectionery shop. What have you got? Cabbage, wood, cigarettes, like, got any sweets? No, that's why I wasn't successful. Seriously? No, I'm joking. Oh. Of course that's not serious. I, I literally thought they just got confused. You ignorant man. <laughs> I'm not ignorant. I just thought they got confused. Like, what? we'll open a confectionery store. What does it sell? I don't know, but I've seen the word. 
Some wood, some what, cigarettes. Because, because they were Norwegian immigrants, you think they couldn't open a confectionery store? Well, I don't know. I, Norwegian I mean, lives matter. Yeah, I should stop being ignorant. Don't, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the business was not successful, and within a year, the shop mysteriously burned down. Oh. They collected the insurance, which paid for another home. Now, they had five children, Caroline, Myrtle, Lucy, an adopted 10-year-old girl known as Jenny Olsen, and Axel. Axel. Yeah. But, unfortunately, Caroline and Axel died in infancy, allegedly of acute colitis. The symptoms of acute colitis, nausea, fever, diarrhoea, and lower abdominal pain and cramping, are also the symptoms of many forms of poisoning. You see where I'm going with this? And so, again, remembering the stomach cancer... Both Caroline and Axel's lives were insured, and the insurance company paid out. Ooh, seen a pattern. Sonson died on July 30th, 1900, reportedly on the day which two life insurance policies on him overlap. The first doctor to see him thought he was suffering from strychnine poisoning. However, the Sonson's family doctor had been treating him for an enlarged heart, and he concluded that the death had been caused by heart failure. Mm. An autopsy was considered unnecessary because the death was not thought suspicious. Gunnis told the doctor that she had given her late husband medicinal powders to help him feel better. That's a bit vague, isn't it? What did you give him? Medicinal Medicinal powders. 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 What kind of powders? Medicinal ones. Right, okay. Could have been anything, couldn't it? Yeah, cocaine. Here, eat this. She applied for the insurance money the day after her husband's funeral. Somerson's relatives claimed that Gunnis had poisoned her husband to collect on the insurance. The insurance companies awarded her $8,500, which is about $260,000 in today's money, with which she brought a farm on the outskirts of Laporte, Indiana. So she's doing all right for herself now, got a lot of money behind her. And in 1901, Gunnis purchased a house on the Clung Road. It's been reported that both the boat and carriage houses burned to the ground shortly after she acquired the property. Weird, that, isn't it? Another fire. Yeah, uh, she's, uh, she likes to stick to her guns, don't she, this one? She does, yeah. But as she was preparing to move from Chicago to Laporte, she became reacquainted with the recent widower, Peter Gunnis, who was also Norwegian-born. They were married in Laporte on April the 1st, 1902. A week after the ceremony, Peter's infant daughter died while alone in the house with Belle. In December 1902, Peter met with a tragic accident. Oh, what kind of accident might this have been? Well, according to Belle, (laughs) you know when people just lie really badly? Yeah, yeah. According to Belle, he was reaching for his slippers next to the kitchen stove when he was scalded with brine. She later declared that, in fact... Part of a sausage grinding machine fell from a high shelf, causing a fatal head injury. <laughs> does brine even reach a boiling point? I imagine it does, but... I, yeah, but it's like, yeah, he got scalded by brine, then something fell on and him. then part of a sausage grinding machine fell from a high shelf on his head. You it's... know those videos you used to watch when you were at school about what not to do at the swimming pool and in the kitchen and stuff? Yeah. Where you have kids running and pushing people into the pool and in the kitchen, you know, using wet hands to turn on plugs. This reminds me of that. Yeah. You know. (laughs) Comedy of errors. Men, don't reach for your slippers next to the kitchen stone while got boiling brine and be careful of falling sausage grinding machine parts. But anyway, that husband's death netted Gunnis another $3,000, which is about $89,500 in today's money. So, a year later, Peter's brother, Gust, took Peter's older daughter, Swanhild, to Wisconsin. She is the only child to have survived living with Belle. Good old Swanhild. Clearly, clearly Swanhild didn't, uh, didn't put her slippers by the uh, stove in the kitchen. She was like, I'm not getting anywhere near Brian. I, she did it right. She was like, nope, these are, these are going under the stairs where they're meant to go. The local people refused to believe that her husband could be so clumsy. He had a run a hog farm on the property and was known to be an experienced butcher. The district coroner reviewed the case and unequivocally announced that he had been murdered. He convened a coroner's jury to look into the matter. Of course the local people were like, he's not that fucking clumsy. Maybe if something fell on his head while he was in a shed or something, possibly, you know, 
Yeah. An unfortunate wheat threshing accident. But no, bending for slippers, getting burnt by Brian and then a sausage machine part falling on top of him. I'm That's... just imagining this unlikely scenario still. And the more I think about it, the funnier it is. It's I mean, it's tragic. It's tragic, but it's, but tragic, but it's just like... Could you not come up with something better? Could you not say, yeah, he was um, trying to get it and the part fell off, it hit him on the head, and then he fell onto the oven where the brine splashed on him and burnt him? See, I've just covered up that murder better than she has, and I've been thinking about it for five seconds. Oh, God. You haven't got $3,000. Anyway, meanwhile, Jenny Olsen, who was then 14, was over here confessing to a classmate, my mama killed my papa, she hit him with a meat cleaver and he died. Don't tell a soul. Snitch. What happens, Jenny? Snitches get stitches, end up in ditches. Or in this case, it would be a pig pen. I can't believe they just called a 14-year-old girl a snitch for saying, my mum's killed my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Loose lips sink ships, Jenny. Anyway, she was brought before the coroner's jury and denied having made the remark. Gunness, meanwhile, convinced the coroner that she was innocent of any wrongdoing. Probably by slipping on a banana peel or something and rolling over the jam. <laughs> Who knows? She did not mention she did not mention that she was pregnant, which would have inspired sympathy. But in May 1903, a baby boy Philip joined the family. It's more insurance claims. I know, yeah. But in late 1906, Bell told neighbours that her foster daughter. Jenny the Snitch Olsen had gone away to a Lutheran college in Los Angeles. In fact, surprisingly, she hadn't. Jenny's body would later be found buried on her adoptive mother's property. Between 1903 and 1906, Belle continued to run her farm. In 1907, Gunnus employed a single farmhand, Ray Lampier, to help with the chores. Now he's going to become a pivotal part of this story. So around this t- same time, Gunness inserted the following advertisement in the matrimonial columns of all the Chicago daily newspapers and those of other large Midwestern cities. I've got the actual advert here for you. Yeah. Now, I know this was another time, but, you know, you want to sell yourself, don't you, to these men? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this was what it said. Personal. Comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in Laporte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with the view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow answer with personal visit. Triflers need not apply. Triflers. <laughs> I no. bought a trifle. Um, no, go away. I won't have your spongy gelat in the street. She's trying to sell herself there. Uh, you know, let's dream fortunes. But, Les, I forgot to mention this to you. She was also six foot tall and weighed over 200 pounds. And she was like a physically strong woman. <laughs> physically <laughs> So basically... I'm not she's... laughing at physically strong. It's just the way it was termed. <laughs> physically strong. She, in other words, she was a big unit. Yeah, she sounds like a bit of a, a bit of a brick shit house. Um, oh, yeah. so anyway. Did she have long blonde braids? Like, just imagining this big Brunhilde like sort of type. <laughs> oh god, no, she didn't. Oh, no, yeah, she she had it in a bun, and he was brown. Anyway, several middle like ages. Mrs. Trunchbull, like like yeah. Arthur Felder. Yeah, Mrs. She's... Trunchbull. <laughs> Several middle-aged... <laughs> <laughs> she comes in. Come in, like, I'm here to join my fortunes. Sit down! <laughs> like, uh, it'd be like uh, the Queen of Hearts and the King of Hearts from the Alice in Wonderland cartoon. She's yeah. like that, that bigger bitch. She needs to say, I'm the king. Hooray! <laughs> 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 Anyway, after that hot advert, several middle-aged men of means responded to Gunness's ad. One of these was John Moe, who arrived from Elbow Lake, Minnesota. Great name there, Elbow Lake, Minnesota. So it was like he's a wrestler, doesn't it? Who am I? Yeah. Hailing from Elbow Lake, Minnesota, weighing in at 235 pounds, John Moe! Anyway... He brought more than a thousand dollars with him to pay off her mortgage, which is around about two thousand nine twenty. No, it's around twenty nine thousand dollars, round about there. Or so he said to the neighbours, because she introduced him as her cousin. 
he disappeared from the farm within a week of his arrival. Next on the line was George Anderson from Toriko, Missouri, who, like Peter Gunnis and John Moe, was an immigrant from Norway. You know how you thought Peter, in his falling over his slippers and getting burnt in a sausage machine part, was funny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, this had me in stitches. Is- I'll try I'll try get through it. During dinner with Anderson, she raised the issue of her mortgage, and Anderson agreed that he would pay this off if they decided to wed. Late that night, Anderson woke up to see his standing over him, holding a guttering candle in her hand with a strange, sinister expression on her face. <laughs> Without uttering a word, she ran from the room. Anderson fled from the house, soon taking a train to Missouri. <laughs> now, <laughs> the reason I'm finding this so funny is, I'm imagining they're sitting at a table together, across from each other. She's there like, for the purpose of this reenactment, she's a southern belle. Mr. Anderson, I have a mortgage and I struggle to pay it. And he's like, well, don't you worry, Miss Gunness. If we decide to wed, I shall pay off your mortgage. And then she sort of just looks at the camera and gives this wink like, ink. Like, <laughs> he's, he's there like, later that night, he's lying in bed, yeah. He's got like a his nightgown, his wee willy winky cap on. And he just sort of opens his eyes and she sees her standing over with this like, got her in candlelight, smiling. And they just like stare at each other. <laughs> she just sort of turns around and runs from the room, but like backwards, she just like, whoop. And then he gets up, he's like, skinny, you know the runs down the path out the house and jumps on a train. There's like a train there, but going to Missouri and he's just jumping on it with his nightgown and hat on. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> else listening to this is going to find that funny. It was just me. <laughs> there is there is a comedy element to it, though, to be fair. Just like... <laughs> I can just imagine him sort of like sneaking out of the window, like she ran out the room, and so did he. <laughs> head to head in the corridor, looking at each other. He's like, "Why are you running?" She's like, "Why are you running?" And he just goes yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> Get to the top of the stairs. After you? No, after you. Thank you. <laughs> oh God, sorry. Anyway. The suitors kept on coming, but none, except for Anderson, <laughs> running away in his nightgown, ever left the Gunnis farm. By this time, she had begun ordering huge trunks to be delivered to their home. Hack driver Clyde Sturgis delivered many such trunks to her from Laporte and later remarked how the heavy set woman would lift these enormous trunks like boxes of marshmallows, tossing them onto her wide shoulders and carrying them into the house. <laughs> She's a big unit. She kept the shutters of her house closed day and night. Farmers travelling past the dwelling at night saw her digging in the hog pen. Ole B. Budsberg, an elderly widower from I- um, Iola, Wisconsin. Wait, what was her name? What was her name? His name was Ole B. Budsberg. That's a fantastic name. That's great Budsberg. name. Anyway, he was an elderly widower from Lola, Wisconsin, appeared next. He was last seen alive in the Laporte Savings Bank on April the 6th, 1907, when he mortgaged his Wisconsin land there, signing over a deed and obtaining several thousand dollars in cash. All they be Budsberg's sons, Oscar and Matthew Budsberg, had no idea that their father had gone off to visit Gunnis. When they finally discovered his destination, they wrote to her, and she promptly responded, saying she had never seen their father. Several other middle-aged men appeared and then disappeared in brief visits to the Gunnis farm throughout 1907. Then, in December 1907, Andrew Halgaleen, a bachelor farmer from Aberdeen, South Dakota, wrote to her and was warmly received. The pair exchanged many letters until a letter overwhelmed Halgaleen, written in Gunnis' own careful handwriting and dated January 13th, 1908. The letter was found at the Halgaleen farm and it read, To the dearest friend in the world, no woman in the world is happier than I am. I know that you are now to come to me and be my own. I can tell you from your letters that you are the man I want. It does not take one long to tell when to like a person, and you I like better than anyone in the world. I know. Think how well we will enjoy each other's company. You, the sweetest man in the whole world, we will be all alone with each other. Can you conceive of anything nicer? I think of you constantly. 
when I hear your name mentioned, and this is when one of the dear children speaks of you, or I hear myself humming it with the words of an old love song. It is beautiful music to my ears. My heart beats in wild rapture for you, my Andrew. I love you. Come prepared to stay forever. Lovely, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think I just squirted. I'm not gonna lie. Jesus. Fucking <laughs> hell. That's a lot better than her advert, isn't it? It's way better than her advert. It seems she got better as the time went on. And I also, to everyone listening, I know that Indiana isn't in the Deep South, but that's the only accent I can do. If I did a Norwegian one, we'd be taken off for, like, it'd be like, to the dearest friend in the world. It'd be rubbish. So she's a Southern belle for this. <laughs> I very much like a company. Yeah, my dearest Andrew heard the flirty kicky in the basket. I know that's Swedish. Burski, 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 burski. I love you, Andrew. Please come to stay forever. Anyway, in response to her letter, Halgin flew to her side in January 1908. He had with him a check for $2,900, which is around about $79,000, his savings, which he had drawn from his local bank. A few days after Halgin arrived, he and Gunnis appeared at the savings bank in Laporte and deposited the check. Halgaline vanished a few days later, but Gunnis appeared at the savings bank to make a $500 deposit, and then another deposit of $700 in the state bank. At this time, she started to have problems with Ray Lampier. In March 1908, Gunnis sent several letters to a farmer and horse dealer in Topeka, Kansas, named Lon Townsend, inviting him to visit her. He decided to put off the visit until spring, and thus did not see her before the fire at her farm. Goodis was also in correspondence with a man from Arkansas and sent him a letter dated May the 4th, 1908. He would have visited her, but did not because of the fire at her farm. Goodis allegedly promised marriage to a suitor, Bert Albert, which did not go through because of his lack of wealth. Poor Bert. Yeah. He's not, he's not deemed good enough to kill. He's <laughs> like, a bit of a basic bitch, isn't she? Yeah, you know. Really? Didn't you? Have you got any money? Yeah, bring it with you. Pay off me mortgage. How has she still got a mortgage? With all this money. Yeah, what is she do what is she doing with this money? Is she like what is just stuffing it in a mattress or something? By the sounds of it, spending it on steroids. <laughs> so Ray Lampier, now he was deeply in love with Belle. He performed any chore for her, no matter how gruesome. He became jealous of many of the men who arrived to court his employer and began making scenes. She fired him on February the third, nineteen oh eight. Shortly after, she presented herself at the Laporte Courthouse. She declared that her former employee was not in his right mind and was a menace to the public. She somehow convinced local authorities to hold a sanity hearing. Lampier was pronounced sane and released. Gunnis went back a few days later to complain to the sheriff that Lampier had visited her farm and argued with her. She contended that he posed a threat to her family and had Lampier arrested for trespassing. Now, Lampier, he returned again and again and again to see her, but she drove him away. And Lampier made thinly disguised threats. On one occasion, he confided to farmer William Slater, Halgaline won't bother me no more, we fixed him for keeps. Another snitch. Halgaline had long since disappeared from the precincts of Laporte, or so it was believed. However, his brother... Azel Halgaline was disturbed when Andrew failed to return home, and he wrote to Belle in Indiana, asking her about his siblings' whereabouts. Gunnis wrote back, telling Aslin Halgaline that his brother was not at her farm and probably went to Norway to visit relatives. It's not my farm, it's probably in Norway. <laughs> Azel wrote back, saying that he did not believe that his brother would do that. Moreover, he believed that his brother was still in the Laporte area, and the last place he was seen or heard from. Gunners brazened it out. She told him that if he wanted to come and look for his brother, she would help conduct a search. But she cautioned him that searching for missing persons was an expensive proposition. If she were to be involved in such a manhunt, she stated, he should be prepared to pay for her efforts. (laughs) (laughs) I will help you find your look for your brother, who I have killed, if you pay me. Anyway... He did come to Laporte, but not until May. Lampier represented an unresolved danger to Belle now. Now Azel was making inquiries that could, you know, cause her to be sent to the gallows. She told a lawyer in Laporte, M. E. Lilleite, that she feared for her life and that of her children. Ray Lampier, she said, had threatened to kill her and burn her house down. She wanted to make out a will in case Lampier went through with his threats. 
The lighter compiled and drew up a will. She left her entire estate to her children and then departed Lilita's offices. She went to one of Laporte's banks holding the mortgage for her property and paid this off. She's finally paid it. You know, it's weird, isn't it? This, you know, she's getting all her affairs in order. She did not go to the police to tell them about Lampier's allegedly life-threatening conduct. The reason for this, most later concluded, was that there had been no threats and she was merely setting the stage for her own arson. You know, she's got previous on this, hasn't she? Yeah. She likes a good arson. She loves arson about. <laughs> arson about. <laughs> what an arson old. Joe Maxson, who had been hired to replace Lampier in February 1908, awoke in the early hours of April 28th, smelling smoke in his room, which was on the second floor of the Gunness house. He opened the hall door to a sheet of flames. Maxson screamed Gunness's name and those of her children, but got no response. He slammed the door and then, in his underwear, leapt from his second-story window out of his room, barely surviving the fire that was closing in about him. He raced to town to get help, but by the time the old-fashioned hook and ladder arrived at the farm at early dawn, the farmhouse was a gutted heap of smoking ruins. Four bodies were found inside the house. One of the bodies was that of a woman who could not be immediately identified as Gunnis, since she had no head. The head was never found. County Sheriff Smutzer had somehow heard about Lampier's alleged threats. He took one look at the carnage and quickly sought out the ex-handyman. The lighter came forward to recount his tale about Gunnis's will and how she feared Lampier would kill her and her family and burn her house down. Now, Lampier didn't help his case much. At the moment, Sheriff Smutzer confronted him and before a word was uttered by the sheriff, Lampier exclaimed, Did Widow Gunnis and the kids get out all right? He was then told about the fire, but denied to have anything to do with it, claiming that he was not near the farm when the blaze occurred. A youth, John Solium, was brought forward. He said that he had been watching the Gunnis place, and that he saw Lampier running down the road from the Gunnis house before the structure erupted in flames. Lampier snorted to the boy, You wouldn't look me in the eye and say that. Yes, I will, replied Solium. You found me hiding in the bushes, and you told me you'd kill me if I didn't get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't say that to me first. yeah i will because you told me get out of there because you found me hiding in the bushes what was this kid doing staring at the barn house in a bush in the middle of the night yeah why what that doesn't make any sense none of this makes sense it's bizarre anyway lampier was arrested and charged with murder and arson then scores of investigators sheriff's deputies coroner's men and many volunteers began searching the ruins for evidence the body of a headless woman was of deep concern to Laporte residents. C. Christofferson, a neighbouring farmer, took one look at the charred remains of the body and said it was not the remains of Belle Gunnis. So did another farmer, L. Nicholson, and so did Mrs. Austin Cutler, an old friend of Gunnis. The more of Gunnis's old friends, Mrs. May Orlando and Mrs. Sigrid Olsen, arrived from Chicago. They examined the remains of the headless woman and said it was not Gunnis. Doctors then measured the remains, and making allowances for the missing neck and head, stated the corpse was that of a woman who stood 5 foot 3 inches tall and weighed no more than 150 pounds. <laughs> so, wow. I know it's hard probably to find a woman who's 6 foot in Laporte. The size discrepancy, isn't it? Really? Oh. Like... Oh, oh, so we will... if she said that one will do. Don't you worry, we will get to that. Detailed measurements of the body were compared with those of the on file with several Laporte stores where she purchased her apparel. When the two sets of measurements were compared, the authorities concluded that the headless woman could not possibly be Balgunis, even when the ravages of fire on the body were taken into account, because the flesh, it was badly burned, but it was still intact. Now, Les, go and play a game. Okay. Okay? Because I went out there did my research and I found the measurements that they took from bell and fire bell as I like to call it okay so then biceps fire bell nine inches what do you think bells were I, I'm gonna go with like is this around yeah is this around yeah a python I'm gonna say uh I don't know like 12 inches 17 inches what the fuck bust Fire bell, 36 inches. What was bells? 36 inches, Jesus. Uh, I'm going to go with 50. Close, 46 inches. 46 
inches. Now her waist fire bells was 26 inches. What was bells? I want to say like 40 inches. 37 inches. 37 inches? Yeah. Thigh fire bells was 25 inches. <sighs> was she, uh, I'm going to say she's close to 32 inches. Yeah, 30 inches. Not too bad. 30 inches? Well, she didn't skip leg day, did she? Hips. Fire bell, 40 inches. Bells were? I'm going to go for hips. About 50 inches. 54 inches. 54? Yeah. Her calves on fire bell were 12 and a half inches. What were bells? I'm going to go with about 22. Uh, 14 inches. 14 inches? Yeah, thin calves. Right, fire bells, wrists. Last one this is. Her wrists were six inches. So bells, okay. About nine, ten inches. Bang on, nine inches. Nine inches. Woohoo! Yeah, well done. So, as you can see there, quite a big discrepancy. Also, with the wrists, I mean, that's you, you're measuring bone there, aren't you? So, that means like her bone structure was way bigger. Exactly, yeah. Anyway, Dr. J. Myers examined the internal organs of the dead woman. He sent stomach contents of the victims to a pathologist in Chicago who reported months later that the organs contained lethal doses of strychnine. Gunnis' dentist, Dr. Ira P. Norton, said that if the teeth slash dental work of the headless corpse had been located, he could definitely ascertain if it was her. Louis Klondike Schultz, a former miner, was hired to build a sluice and began sifting through the debris. As more bodies were unearthed, the sluice was used to isolate human remains on a larger scale. On the 19th of May, 1908, a piece of bridge work was found consisting of two human canine teeth, their roots still attached, porcelain teeth and a gold crown work in between. Norton identified them as work done for Gunnis. As a result, Coroner Charles Mark officially concluded that the adult female body discovered in the ruins was Belle Gunnis even though it's a good 10 inches shorter. Also, that dental work could, I, I, I mean, like, I assume that could be taken out. Oh, yeah. Anyway, Halgaleen, Hazel Halgaleen, arrived in Laporte and told Sheriff Smutzer that he believed his brother had met with foul play at Gunnis' hands. Then Joe Maxson came forward with information that could not be ignored. He told the sheriff that Gunnis had ordered him to bring a load of dirt by a wheelbarrow to a large area surrounding the high wire fence where the hogs were fed. Maxon said that there were deep depressions in the ground that had been covered by dirt. These filled-in holes, Gunnis had told Markson, contained rubbish. She wanted the ground made level, so he filled in the depressions. Smutzer took a dozen men back to the farm and began to dig. On May 3rd, 1908, the diggers unearthed the body of Jenny Olsen, who vanished in 1906. Then they found the small bodies of two unidentified children. Subsequently, the body of Andrew Halgaleen was unearthed. And his overcoat was actually being worn by Ray Lampier as well when he was arrested. Oh, God. So he was there arrested, saying, I haven't done this, while wearing the guy's coat. <laughs> Did it have the guy's name in it, like, as a label? Like, Pro- it's probably monogrammed, is... wasn't it? It probably was, like, on the lapels, on both lapels. This isn't your name. <laughs> as days progressed and the gruesome work continued, one body after another was discovered in the Gunness hog pen. So I'm going to go through the names who was found in the pen. This gives you an idea of how many people were there. In the hog pen, we had Ole B. Budsberg of Lola, Wisconsin, vanished in May 1907. Thomas Limbo, who had left Chicago and gone to work as a hired man for Gunnish three years earlier. Henry Gerthold of Scandinavia, Wisconsin, who had gone to wed her a year earlier, taking $1,500 to her. A watch belonging to Gerthold was found with a body. Olaf Sven Herod from Chicago. John Moe of Elbow Lake, Minnesota. And his watch was found in Lampier's possessions. Jesus Christ, Ray. Honestly, Ray, come on. Also, um, Olaf Lindblom, age 35, from Wisconsin. Reports of other possible victims began to come in. These consisted of William Minge, a coachman from New York who had left the city on April the 1st. Herman Konitzer of Chicago, who disappeared in January 1906. Charles Edmund of New Carlisle, Indiana. George Berry of Tuscola, Illinois. Christy Hifkin of Dover of Barron County, Wisconsin, who sold his farm and came to Laporte in 1906. 
Charles Nyberg, a 28-year-old Scandinavian immigrant who lived in Philadelphia, he told friends he was going to visit Gunnis in 1906 and never came back. He had been working for a saloon keeper and took $500 with him. John H. McJunkin of Corapolis near Pittsburgh left his wife in December 1906 after corresponding with a Laporte woman. Olaf Jensen, a Norwegian immigrant of Carroll, Indiana, wrote his relatives in 1906 he was going to marry a wealthy widow in Laporte. Henry Bisgy of Laporte, who disappeared in 1906, and his hired man named Edward Canary of Pink Lake, who also vanished in 1906. Bert Chase of Michigan, Indiana, don't know why I said it like Indiana, sold his butcher shop and told friends of a wealthy widow he was going to look her up. His brother received a telegram supposedly from Aberdeen, South Dakota, claiming Burke had been killed in a train wreck. His brother investigated and found the telegram was fictitious. Tuns Peterson, lead of Rushford, Minnesota, is alleged to have disappeared in April 1907. A gold ring marked SB May 28, 1907 was found in the ruins. A hired man named George Bradley of Tacola, Illinois, is alleged to have gone to Laporte to meet a widow and three children in October 1907. T.J. Ty Fland of Minneapolis is alleged to have come to see Guinness in 1907. Frank Ridinger, a farmer from Waukesha, Wisconsin, came to Indiana in 1907 to marry and never returned. Emil Tell, a Swede from Kansas City, Missouri, is alleged to have gone in 1907 to Laporte. Lee Porter of Bartonville, Oklahoma, separated from his wife and told his brother he was going to marry a widow in Laporte. John E. Hunter left Duquesne, Pennsylvania on November 25th, 1907, after telling his daughters he was going to marry a wealthy widow in northern Indiana. Two other Pennsylvanians, George Williams and Ludwig Stahl, also left their homes to marry in the West. Abraham Phillips, a railway man of Burlington, left in the winter of 1907 to go to North Indiana to marry a rich widow. Benjamin Carling of Chicago, Illinois, was last seen by his wife in 1907 after telling her he was going to Laporte to secure an investment with a rich widow. He had with him $1,000 from an insurance company and borrowed money from several investors as well. In June 1908, his widow was able to identify his remains from Laporte's pauper cemetery by the contour of his skull and three missing teeth. Org Gunnison of Green Lake, Wisconsin, Ole Olson of Battle Creek, Michigan, Linda Nicholson of Huron, South Dakota, Andrew Anderson of Lawrence, Kansas, Johann Sorensen of St. Joseph, Missouri, and a possible victim was a man named Hitley. Reported unnamed victims were a daughter of Mrs. H. Witzer of Toledo, Ohio, who had attended Indiana University near Laporte in 1902, an unknown man or woman or alleged to have disappeared in September 1906, the same night Jenny Olson went missing. Gunnis claimed they were a Los Angeles professor and his wife who had taken Jenny to California. A brother of Miss Jenny Graham of Wakusha, Wisconsin, who had left her to marry a rich widow in Laporte but vanished. A hired man from Ohio, age 50, name unknown, is alleged to have disappeared and Gunnis became the heir to his horse and buggy. An unnamed man from Montana told people at a resort he was going to sell Gunnis a horse and buggy, which were found with several other horses and buggies at the farm. So, that's a lot of people. That is a yeah. lot of people. Now, we can laugh about different things in this and all, but all of those, you know, are people with families and different things like that, and that's a lot of people who've gone to visit her and haven't come back. Yeah, completely. And probably, like, I mean, the emotional manipulation of it is quite horrific as well. Because, like, for a lot of them, like especially the suitors to to all intents and purposes that was probably probably seemed like a new life for them like a new start well you had men leaving their wives for it or saying yeah. to the kids right we're going i'm going to go marry this widow i'll send for you you know it's, it's going to be okay i mean it's like it's a it, lot it's horrific isn't it it is i mean i mean there is a large comedy element because she was a giant. But... When we laugh, we'll laugh about how her husband, she said her husband was murdered and the dude running back to Missouri and stuff like that. But when you read out the names like that, that sort of, you know, it snaps you back into it of, shit, this woman was fucking evil as fuck. Yeah, and, and seemingly, like, completely motivated by money. I mean, oh, do, definitely. You, do you think like that... I mean, I don't, I, I mean, like, were the killings just, like, a consequence, uh, like, a means to an end? I mean, 
doesn't it just see it doesn't seem like she was getting off on the killings or anything. It just seemed like she, she enjoyed having money. Exactly. Most of the remains that were found on the property couldn't be identified um, because of the crude recovery methods and the exact number of the individuals on Earth and the chemist form is unknown. But it's believed to be approximately 12. Now, on May 19th, 1908, remains of it, approximately seven unknown victims were buried in two coffins in unmarked graves in the pauper section of Laporte's Pine Lake Cemetery. Andrew Halgaline and Jenny Olsen are buried in Laporte Patton Cemetery, also near Peter Gunnis. Ray Lampier, he was arrested on May 22nd, 1908, and he was tried for murder and arson. He denied the charges of arson and murder that were filed against him. His defence hinged on the assertion that the body was not Gunnis's. His lawyer, who's got an awesome name, you ready? Wirt Warden, developed Wirt evidence. Warden. Wirt Warden developed evidence that contradicted Norton's identification of the teeth and bridge work. A local jeweller testified that though the gold and the bridge work had emerged from the fire almost undamaged, the fierce heat of the fire had melted the gold plating on several watches and items of gold jewellery. Local doctors replicated the conditions of the fire by attaching a similar piece of dental bridge work to a human jawbone and placing it in a blacksmith's forge. The real teeth crumbled and disintegrated. The porcelain teeth came out pocked and picked, and the gold parts rather melted. Both the artificial elements were damaged to a greater degree than those in the bridge work offered as evidence as Gunnar's identity. Hired handman Joe Maxson and another man also testified they'd seen Klondike Schultz take the bridge work out of his pockets and plant it just before it was discovered. Lampier was found guilty of arson, but he was acquitted of murder. On November 26, 1908, he was sentenced to 20 years in the state prison in Michigan City. He died of TB on December 30th, 1909. So, poor Ray. All he did, all he was guilty of was loving the wrong woman. You know, he's probably had something to do with killing all the people because he did whatever she wanted. She probably said to him, you know, help me kill these people, me and you are going to be together. And then it all went tits up. Yeah, gaslighting, folks. But there's another twist to the tale. On January the 14th, 1910, the Reverend E.A. Shell came forward with a confession that Lampier had said to have made to him while the clergyman was comforting the dying man. In it, Lampier revealed Gunnis' crimes and swore that she was still alive. Lampier had stated to the Reverend Shell and to a fellow convict, Harry Mayers, shortly before his death, that he had not murdered anyone, but he had helped Gunnis bury many of her victims. When a victim arrived, she made him comfortable, charming him, cooking him a large meal. Then she drugged his coffee, and when the man was in a stupor, she'd split his head open with a meat chopper. Sometimes she would simply wait for the suitor to go to bed, and enter the bedroom by candlelight and chloroform his sleeping victim. Now, you know, she's a big unit. She would then carry the body to the basement, place it on a table and dissect it. Then she'd bundle the remains and buried them in the hog pen and the grounds about the house. Now, Bella had become an expert at dissection thanks to the instruction received from her second husband, Peter Gunnis, who was a butcher. To save time, she sometimes poisoned her victim's coffee with strychnine. She also varied the disposal methods, sometimes dumping the corpse into the hog scalding vat, covering the remains with quicklime. Lampier even stated that if Belle was overly tired after murdering one of her victims, she merely chopped up the remains in the middle of the night, stepped into a hog pen and fed the remains to the hogs. The handyman also cleared up the mysterious question of the headless female corpse, found in the smoky ruins of the Gunners' home. Gunnis had lured this woman from Chicago on the pretense of hiring her as a housekeeper only days before she decided to make her permanent escape from Laporte. Gunnis, according to Lampier, had drugged the woman, then bashed in her head and decapitated the body, taking the head, which had weights tied to it, to a swamp where she threw it into the deep water. Then she chloroformed her children, smothered them to death and dragged their small bodies, along with the headless corpse, to the basement. She dressed the female corpse in her old clothing and removed the, her false teeth, placing these beside the headless corpse to assure it being identified as Belle Gunnis. She then torched the house and fled. Lampier had helped her, he admitted, but he had not left by the road where he waited for her after the fire had been set. She had betrayed her one-time partner in crime in the end by cutting across the open fields and then disappearing into the woods. So, she said to him here, right, this is what we're going to do, we're going to do this, me and you are going to have our own life together, wait for me on the road. And she's fucked off out of the backfields. That's really tragic. Like, he's just waiting there. And then he saw that kid. 
had me yeah, pushes. Yeah, and at some point, like, don't say anything or I'll kill like, you. Kid there, like, what the fuck are you doing, you little peeping Tom? You know, the kid's like, I can say what I want now. No one's going to have a go at me for tugging one off in a bush, is it? Over the, <laughs> over the woman with, with broad shoulders. <laughs> you like them big. She reminds me of my daddy. Anyway, Lampier said that Gunnis was a rich woman, as she had murdered 42 men by his count, perhaps more, and had taken amounts ranging from $1,000, which is $27,000 in our money, to $32,000, which is around $873,000. She allegedly accumulated more than $250,000 through her murder screams over the years. A huge fortune for those days, and nowadays as well, because it equates to around about $6.8 million dollars. She had a small amount remaining in one of her saving accounts, but local banks later admitted that she had indeed withdrawn most of her funds shortly before the fire. The fact that Gunnis withdrew most of her money suggested that she was planning to evade the law. So, Gunnis was for several decades allegedly seen or sighted in cities around towns throughout the United States. I wonder if they like said, oh my god, I've seen Bigfoot, but it wasn't, it was Belle Gunnis. <laughs> or indeed... You're like, I've seen Bell Gunners and Bigfoot says, It's like, I'm not fucking here. I'm Bigfoot. Look at me. No, I can't. That's what Bell Gunners would say. <laughs> it's like I'm nowhere near as hairy or strong. <laughs> Measure me thighs. I'm not a... Right. As late as 1931, Gunners was reported alive and living in a Mississippi town where she supposedly owed a great deal of property and lived the life of a prominent lady. Smutzer, for more than 20 years, received an average of two reports a month. She became part of American criminal folk world. A female bluebeard. See? That's where the bluebeard thing comes in. Because you, before, you were like, what the fuck's the animal? The bodies of the Gunnis' three children were found in the home's wreckage, but the headless adult female corpse found with them was never positively identified. Gunnis' true fate is unknown, and the port residents were divided between believing that she was killed by Lampier and that she faked her own death. In 1931, a woman known as Esther Carlson was arrested in Los Angeles for poisoning August Lindstrom for money. Two people who had known Gunnis claimed to recognise her from photographs, but the identification was never proved. Carlson died while awaiting trial. The body that was believed to be Belle Gunnis was buried next to her first husband at the Forest Home Cemetery in Forest Park, Illinois. Now, we've got a little update from November the 5th, 2007. With the permission of the descendants of Bell's sister, the headless body was exhumed from the Gunnis grave in the Forest Home Cemetery by a team of forensic anthropologists and graduate students from the University of Indianapolis in an effort to learn her true identity. So they hoped that a sealed envelope flap of a letter found on the victim's farm would contain enough DNA to be compared to that of the body. Unfortunately, there was not enough DNA there so efforts to continue to find a reliable source for comparison purposes. They are looking for additional living relatives and things. But who knows? That is the Bell Gunnis story there. It's a tragic story for many reasons. Um, she killed a lot of people. She killed her own children. Poor old Ray. I do feel sorry for him. He was just in love with her. I, yeah, I do a bit. Like It's just... Uh... He was completely under a thrall, wasn't he, really? Um, and just fell afoul of it, because, like, we, we've all done that at some point, haven't we? Like, Yeah, but not to the, to the extent of, you know, girls like, oh, I can't fool God tonight, you know, will you buy me some drink? Yeah, yeah, you know, at the end of the night, she's getting off with someone else, and I'm like, oh, that's got him, but, you know, never mind. I didn't think, oh, I'm going to go find a kid in a bush and threaten him, or something like that, but... Or nick the guy's coat and wear that with a watch. Um, she definitely faked her own death, didn't she? Oh, she definitely faked her own death. I mean, if I was her, which I'm not, obviously. Um, I, I don't know. Six foot, you know, you're a big lad, aren't you? You know, broad shoulders. Broad shoulders. Um, I, I think her biceps are like an inch bigger than mine. Um, <laughs> Jesus. To be, fair, to be fair, mate, when Hulk Hogan went to WCW after the steroids, I think she was about, her biceps are about as big as his. Because he didn't have the 24-inch pythons then. No, no, he didn't. But yeah, anyway, I mean, if if I was her, um, the easiest thing to do would just be to fuck off back to Norway. But how are you going to get all that money over there? You've got to get a passport and stuff. In America, you know, you got to think this is like early 
1900s, you know, you're in the capital, you go to like three states over, people aren't going to know you. Remember when Bundy was killing in Seattle and then he went to Florida, you know, Utah, they didn't communicating with him. They didn't, they hadn't even heard of like, you know, Seattle Ted. And in Florida, Bundy's walking around with his face because no one knew who he was. So uh, that's the 70s. So, you know, you got to think early 1900s, go two states over. She's fine, isn't she? Yeah. And there's no surveillance then either, is there really? No. Like, just a kid in a bush, isn't there? That's just a kid. That's maybe, maybe that's what it was. was. Like, maybe this is a missing part of history we don't know about. Like, early, 20th, early 20th century closed caption television. He was a fucking little kid in a bush. Yeah, you sit in that bush and you learn some quarters. It's better than getting down the mines. <laughs> But yeah, guys, that was Belle Gunness. Let us know what you think. Do you think she did fake a death? Or do you think it, that was her, but shrank down a lot? And the things like I've always said, please let us know what you think in the comments. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, and also Instagram. They're all in the link below. And yeah, guys, it's been great. Let us know what you think in the comments. Please, if you this is your first time here or you've got here from another video, probably still be a like by all accounts. Please give us a subscribe. To all the old people listening, subscribe doesn't mean you have to pay anything. You just click a button. That's it. It helps us out. Hit that little bell notification. Apparently that does something. Just like the video and comment what you think of us. So guys, it's been great catching up with you all again. That was a great episode. We will bring you more soon. I'm Jan from Film Daddy. He's been Les from Tales from the Hangman. Yeah, Catch you yeah. around.